The feeding of the multitude is clearly very, very important in the early churches of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It appears actually twice in Mark's gospel, chapter seven and eight in Mark. And since the other gospels drew from Mark, Matthew has also got the feeding of the multitude two times, chapter 14 and 15. We're reading here from chapter 15, the second feeding of the multitude. Now, Luke has it only one time in chapter nine, but John is very interesting because John's gospel in chapter six has a long narrative about the feeding of the multitude. He only mentions it once. But in John's gospel, it's very clear the feeding of the multitude is a type, an understanding of the Eucharist. Since after Jesus fed the multitude in John, he preaches about the bread of life. He preaches about the Eucharist. And John, of course, does not have the Eucharist at the Last Supper. John's theology of the Eucharist appears at the feeding of the multitude. Back to Matthew here, who has it twice. The first one in chapter 14 is the feeding of the Jews, and they take up 12 baskets. This one, the second feeding, is 4,000. The first one was 5,000. This is 4,000. And it's the feeding of the Gentiles. And scholars, I, I've gone through all of this in the Holy Land many times. Scholars will point out that the second feeding happens in Gentile territory. Therefore, it's a feeding of the Gentiles. And rather subtle, but very interesting. The feeding of the Jewish people, the 12, 12 baskets, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, you know. The feeding of the Gentiles here has seven baskets, which are symbolic, they say, of the seven Gentile countries which surrounded the area. So what does this mean? Clearly, it's the miracle, the miracle of feeding the multitude. Clearly, it's meant to be a preamble to understanding the Eucharist. Clearly, the Eucharist, therefore, is a sacrament of inclusion. Jesus feeds the Gentiles. So it's meant to be a sacrament of inclusion, a sacrament of binding, a sacrament of building community, a sacrament where community comes alive, where there's healing, there's feeding of those who are hungry, who qualifies to be fed in the great miracle, those who are hungry. Now that's very interesting. It says, who belongs to the living God in Jesus Christ? From my way of thinking, I wouldn't be too rigid about that. Who is a child of God? Years ago, I saw in Calcutta that Mother Teresa's sisters would pick up the dying people, Hindus, India, it's only 2% Christian, so Hindus, and take them to a place called Caligat, which was our home for the dying, not the destitute. Other places took the poor and the destitute, but this was a home for the dying. And these poor people dying, maggot, infested and, you know, abandoned. They're dying on the streets of Calcutta in the slums. Mother Teresa would take them to Caligat. And there they would wash them clean, put them on a stretcher, and a volunteer, and I volunteered at, at Caligat one time, the volunteers and the sisters would stay with the person who was dying, maybe just rub their hands, uh, she wanted to make sure that this person who was dying knew that 
You are a child of God. You are loved. I want you to die knowing that you're a child of God and you are loved. But Mother Teresa would never baptize a Hindu. It would offend the Hindu to baptize a Hindu. And yet, she had this firm belief that the Hindus belong to the kingdom of God somehow. It's an extraordinary thing. It's challenging, and it causes us to think again. So when you get to the type, what we call a type in Scripture of Eucharist here, we have to ask ourselves about Eucharist as a sacrament of community, a sacrament of building, a sacrament of healing, uh, a sacrament that makes the church come alive. Now, that raises all sorts of interesting questions about who can qualify and who fits in and so forth, but the questions should be asked. We don't have time now to answer all the questions, but they are good questions. The questions should not be dismissed. So listen to Eucharist here, the type of Eucharist appearing in the feeding of the multitude. And what will this mean to us today? It means that we are called to be Eucharistic people, followers of Jesus Christ, nurtured and strengthened by our faith and our belonging to the Eucharist. Therefore, to bless people, to include people, to see the presence of God in people who differ with us, to see the child of God in everybody we meet. I mean, that's, that's living Eucharist. That's what brings us to life. Therefore, we withhold judgments about people. We're inclined to divide people and say, well, these are the lost and these are the found and these are the outsiders. And they Look for the presence of God this day, today. Look for the presence of God in all people whom you meet. And then you and I will become living Eucharist, binding, healing, including, forgiving. That, that's what living Eucharist means. Augustine was the one that says, behold who you are and become what you receive. You don't receive the Eucharist. You must become the Eucharist which you receive. Keep that in mind today. It could change our day.